the source of life, hope and peace, Jesus the great I am, Jesus the great I am, who is the light that shows the way to give us freedom from sin. Because Jesus is the great I am, we can trust him, can't we? Let's be seated. God has given us so much. Are you grateful this morning? We're here to worship a great God, and that worship includes giving back to God. We don't just give praise from our lips or our hands when we sign. We don't just listen or watch a sermon. We worship God through fellowshipping with each other in the way that we fellowship. We worship God through observing the Lord's table, and we worship God through giving back from the abundance that he's lavished upon us. We highlight giving every Sunday, not because Countryside wants your money, but we highlight giving every Sunday to remind you of the joy of giving to the Lord. The blessed occasion of worship 
through giving. And we can give to the Lord confidently because we know He will take care of us as He always has. So would you please pray along with me that God would provide abundantly through us, that God would infuse our church with intense joy as we give to Him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the joyful occasion to worship you through giving. You're always good to us. You've blessed us, even those of us with the least amount of possessions or money. You've blessed each one of us over the top. You've supplied each one of us with our truest needs. And so as we give to you, we can do so with confidence that you will never fail to be the ultimate provider you've always been. Lord, would you please infuse our church all the more with hearts of contentment, hearts of praise to you, hearts that desire to give to you out of pure joy. Would you please provide for countryside through us? We depend on you. We're so thankful. We don't have to look at each other wondering how things are going to hold together because you're the one holding them together. Lord, we also ask that you would be with our sister church in Lawrence, Redemption Hill. Please be with Pastor J.D. and Pastor Stephen as they lead the congregation this morning. Please guide the church body as they worship and fellowship, but also as they give. Lord, we ask that you would provide for the needs of Redemption Hill through your people. We also pray for our sister churches in Mochicaui, Mexico, Maceo, Brazil, and Aracaju, Brazil. Lord, please provide for the needs of those churches through your people and and give them grace to be shining lights in their communities. And Lord, please continue to raise up leaders from within. God, we trust you as we give today. Help us to be faithful in giving as a response to your faithfulness to provide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you didn't obtain one of the little communion cups when you came in, uh, you can certainly... Get up and grab one of those. They're on the back tables. Um, The cracker, by the way, is included in the same package as the juice. It's just on top. So uh, anyone who is a believer in Jesus is invited to participate, even if this is your first time uh, visiting countryside. Um, If you're a believer in Christ, if you place your faith and trust in him, we welcome you to join us. And of course, if, if you happen to be under church discipline anywhere, Or if you've not placed your faith and trust in Jesus for your salvation, we just ask that you watch and listen instead of eating and drinking with us. We're celebrating the Lord's table in the middle of our song service. Well, why do we do that? Why do we do it during the songs and instead of of doing it alongside the sermon? Well, from a a liturgy standpoint, we do it this way because it's, it's an important piece in preparing our hearts to receive the Word of God. You know, the Bible doesn't... The Bible doesn't tell us when to observe communion on Sunday, but the Bible does tell us what to do when we observe the Lord's table. And what the Bible tells us to do is to keep from participating in an unworthy manner. That is, if you have sin in your life you haven't confessed and repented of, you must do so now. Taking part in the Lord's Supper is a wonderful thing, but we must not take it lightly. So right now, Uh, What we're going to do is have one to two minutes of sincere heart reflection, just you and the Lord. If God brings a sin to your mind that you haven't dealt with, this is the time. Address your heart with God uh, for the next few moments. as we get ready to think about these elements. So let's just go ahead and open the packages. There's 
two of them on top of the elements. So there's one on the very top. You can open and pull out the cracker. And then there's another one that you can pull off to open up for the juice. <clears throat> so when Scripture tells us what to do in the Lord's table as part of it, we're first of all told not to participate in an unworthy manner, but the second thing Scripture tells us to do is to remember Jesus. And by, by the way, that's why our pastors lead communion every Sunday instead of just having communion be something that you sort of grab on the table when you walk in and go ahead and you know, pop the top open and, and drink that and eat the cracker when you first walk in. Um, because we want to make sure that you're fully reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus. One of, the, one of the instructions, the only instructions that Jesus gave regarding the Lord's table was to observe it in remembrance of him. It's one of the only commands, and so it really matters what you think about during communion. So what are you thinking about? What, what are you daydreaming about during the Lord's table? Are you thinking about the restaurant you're going to for Mother's Day? Are you thinking about something from work, something from the music this morning, something from your commute? Jesus said, do this, that's the eating and the drinking, in remembrance of me. Jesus knew that remembering him, that setting our thoughts on him and his sacrifice for us would be so instrumental in shaping our perspective, in shaping our affections, in shaping our love, and shaping our faith. And we need to be drawn back to the cross as an essential preparation to do what Jesus talks about in at the very end of Isaiah, what did Jesus say through the prophet Isaiah? He said, this is the one on whom I will look. Isaiah 66, he who is humble and contrite in heart and who trembles at my word. You know, to tremble at the word of God, to be in awe of the word of God, uh, of God through his word, uh, him speaking, involves setting our perspective in the right place, rooting it in the sacrifice of Jesus, the truth of what he has accomplished. He paid for your sin, an awful payment, a terrible punishment. He took on your sin debt and all its filth and all its ugliness, and he took it on himself so that you could take on something, his perfect righteousness. Think on Jesus as I read these words from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, we need times like this to stop moving, to, to stop running our thoughts down every highway of life, and to just be still and remember Jesus. And that remembrance shapes our perspective, it shapes our worship, it shapes our fellowship, and it must shape our daily lives as we experience all the benefits of his sacrifice, freedom from sin, and life in his name. I'd like to ask one of our deacons, John Rule, to pray before we eat the bread together. Shall we pray? Father, we acknowledge each of us that our lives have fallen short of your glory that we have sinned against you yet we know that christ in his great love has come and given his life uh, to pay the penalty for our sin as we observe communion this morning and take this bread we desire to recommit our lives to know and serve Christ. We pray in his name, amen. It's with confidence and joy that we eat this together in remembrance of Jesus.
I'd like to ask another one of our deacons, Ryan Lynch, would you please pray before we drink the juice together? Lord, we thank you so much for this most extreme sacrifice of all time. Lord, you gave your body to be brutally beaten. Lord, and hung on a cross. Lord, and allowed your blood to be the payment that was required so that we could spend eternity with you as your children. And we are so grateful to you for that. Amen. Amen. Let's drink in remembrance of Jesus. And let's continue worshiping the Lord through more singing this morning. Would you join us in standing?
Amen. You may be seated. Appreciate the worship team this morning and their preparation and those songs. They're really good in setting our hearts in a place to receive God's word this morning. Well, Scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. I'll let the interpreter get up here real quick. <laughs> Scripture says in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Mother's Day is the kind of occasion where we get to live out those words. Mother's Day is a day of celebration and sorrow. Happiness and heaviness. And I, I want to celebrate with all you mothers in just a moment, but before I do, I want to first recognize that some of you sitting in these seats and some of you watching this service are hurting. Some of you are experiencing the first Mother's Day without your mother. Some of you are reminded of a mother passed away. Some of you desire with all your heart to be a mother, and yet God's not seen fit to provide you with children. Whatever the case may be, Mother's Day is a painful reminder for some of you. And I want us to put Romans 12, 15 into practice. So I'd like you all to please bow with me for a moment in prayer. Lord, you are God over all things. As your creation, we belong to you. We trust you that you're sovereign and that you're good. We pray that your desires would be accomplished in our midst today. And Lord, we specifically think of those right now here in this room and those who might be watching this service who are in pain. Lord, you please bring a soothing balm to the hearts of those who have lost their mothers or who are separated from their mothers. We ask that you would see fit to comfort them and bring them peace. Lord, we also pray for those who have miscarried, who've lost their children. And those whose children continually run further and further away from them and from you. And we think of those who are desperate to have children, but experience the grief of emptiness and sadness because you've not chosen to give them children in your sovereign and your good will. Lord, for all these, we ask for an extra measure of joy and comfort and hope this morning. If it would please you, Lord, we ask that they might see through the cloudy sadness to trust and depend on you more today. We ask that you would shower them with hope and comfort in Jesus. And it's in his strong name we pray. Amen. Well, to those of you who are, who are hurting, we love you. Take heart that God is not only Lord over all creation, but he deeply cares about your pain today. As God's people, we're also here for you to be, to be used by God however he might use us. By the way, that's why we sing together. It's not because the songs are the worship leader's pick. Um, that week we sing together because we really um, need to be surrounded by people who are visibly, uh, through signing or vocally, through singing, declaring truth about God. So please know you're surrounded by people that want to help shoulder your burden. Romans 12, 15 also says to rejoice with those who rejoice. And so I'd like to have all those who are mothers to please stand up. We're going to do something. I know you're all dreading this, but secretly you love it. So mothers, please stand. I want to identify exactly which one of you have celebrated the most Mother's Days this morning. And uh, I want to identify our, our Mother's Day champion. So if you have been married, or, sorry, married, let's say this, if you've, if you've been a mother for at least uh, uh, a year or less, let say a year or less, would you sit down? A mother for a, just a year or less. How about five years or less? If you've been a mother for five years or less, please be seated. All right, 10 years or less. All right. If you've been a mother for 15 years, or less, would you be seated? 20 years or less. I'm going to start going by decades now. 
If you've been a mother for 30 years or less, would you please sit down? 40 years or less. Yeah. 50 years or less. Okay, Jody, you can sit down. <laughs> If you've been a mother for 60 years or less, would you please sit down? Wow, 65 years or less. Wow, 70 years or less. I think we have a Mother's Day champion. We do. And... Our live stream team loves it when I do this, uh, but I just wanted to give you something. So, happy Mother's Day to you. Oh, we appreciate you. Yeah. And the rest of you can turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. You're probably wondering, wow, that's great. So what sort of passage, what sort of passage are we going to be diving into for Mother's Day. Well, it's the passage that says, judge not and you'll be not judged. <laughs> and thankfully, this is something that no mother has struggled with. So <laughs> it's very fitting. But actually, this is the next passage in our Matthew series. So this is the very next one. And that's where we're at this morning. But I just, I did want to take a moment to just rejoice with those of you mothers and celebrate, and certainly uh, we admire you and are in awe of God's faithfulness in your life. Matthew chapter 7, would you all join me in standing as we read the first six verses of Matthew 7? Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Lord, as we look at your word today, would you please do something in our hearts? Would you take your word and use it in the hands of your spirit to do a great work in the hearts of your people? We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There's probably no verse in all of scripture that's more loved and well-known by the world, by people in our culture than Matthew 7, 1. Don't judge me, right? Everyone knows the Bible says don't judge. Unbelievers love that. Many of us love that because we don't like the idea of being evaluated by opinionated people. But this little section of Jesus' sermon has more to do with the gospel and with evaluating our own hearts than we would like to admit. We're in the third and final chapter of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we've been in this sermon for quite some time, working our way through chapters five and six, and now we're beginning the final section of this famous sermon. But there's something that kind of feels out of place. Jesus was talking at the end of chapter six about being anxious. You all remember last time Pastor Scott I uh, was preaching in our Matthew series. He walked us through verses 25 to 34 from chapter 6, a great passage that deals with the subject of worry. Don't be anxious for your life. And then coming off the heels of that passage, it sort of feels odd to then transition into talking about judging people. Well, is this, is this a natural progression? Is this really out of place? I think that's a good question to begin with. You know, chapter 5 was a very lengthy chapter that dealt primarily with a character sketch of true kingdom disciples. That means to be a participant in God's kingdom, you are set apart, you are different, you're pure on the inside, not just pure on the outside. And friends, that's a key theme throughout Jesus' sermon. 
being genuine, being sincere. There are many ways to describe chapter 5, but one of the main themes of that chapter is the theme that true kingdom disciples are consistent in purity inwardly as well as outwardly. I hope you see that theme. We saw it with the inward qualities of the Beatitudes. We saw it with the inward qualities with anger and lust and divorce and retaliation and oaths and loving your neighbors with those realities on the inside. Jesus has been consistently teaching about inner realities being more severe than outer realities. And then this amazing transition happens in chapter 6. Jesus continues talking about consistency. So don't give or fast or pray like who? The hypocrites, right? That's all throughout chapter 6. The hypocrites are those who live two realities. They live an inner reality, and that's the opposite of their outward action. So there's this comparison, there's this warning against mismatched inward and outward realities, mismatched private and public lives. And so Jesus teaches us how to pray, how to give, how to fast, how to trust in God, Because God knows that this kind of genuine Christianity puts everything in God's hands. And Jesus describes God's hands as trustworthy hands. And so it it actually fits amazingly with what Jesus has been saying here in our text. Because look what Jesus is doing here in chapter 7. He's talking about hypocrisy again. Don't try to remove the speck from your brother's eye when there's a log in your eye. Don't judge because you'll be judged. Interesting how this theme of genuine Christianity, genuine living, genuine heart matched with genuine actions is flowing through all three chapters of Jesus' sermon. So we shouldn't be surprised that the next subject on Jesus' agenda is consistent with his warnings against hypocrisy from chapter 6. And so we can expect that throughout chapter 7, we'll be constantly connected to the themes that Jesus has been teaching. So this morning, as we walk through these six verses, we're going to constantly be looking back at the building blocks that have led up to our text this morning. All right, so some of you are taking notes following an outline that kind of helps you follow along and track along with the message. Um, And so if you're doing so, the first observation we're making this morning is that you are not qualified to judge like God. You are not qualified to judge like God. That's an interesting, interesting way of saying it. Well, let's look at it in verses 1 and 2. Okay? Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So we need to first identify what Jesus means by the word judge. We have to understand that word if we're going to understand the passage. In fact, understanding this word is going to be crucial for reconciling the command we see at the end of the message. The end of the passage here in verses 5 and 6. Well, why is that? Because verses 5 and 6 seem to indicate that Jesus is calling for some kind of judgment to be made from us. So let's talk about the word judge in verses 1 and 2. The word judge comes from the Greek word krino. That's the root word uh, for what's used in verses 1 and 2. And it refers specifically to condemnation here. Condemnation. True disciples, true disciples are not to condemn Others. Well, what does Jesus mean by commanding us not to condemn others? What does that mean in plain language? Probably the best way to understand uh, that kind of condemnation is to understand what it's not. To understand what it's not. In, in condemnation, think with me here, in condemnation, there's no forgiveness. In condemnation, there's no mercy. In condemnation, there's, there's no resolution other than the person who is condemned getting the just punishment for their wrong. So when we understand the Greek word krino to be referring to an absence of forgiveness and mercy and only justice in its purest form, what picture does that give us? Well, it gives us a picture of a position we're not qualified for. Only God is qualified to be the true judge. Only God is qualified to condemn people. Only God is qualified to sentence people to punishment and to punish them by his own hand. 
This is where the world misinterprets the word judge here in these verses. When most people hear Matthew 7 verse 1, they think of a different word than condemnation. They're not thinking condemnation here. There are two words that people think of in, when, they, when they quote, doesn't the Bible say don't judge? Here's the two words they're thinking of, evaluation and discernment. Evaluation and discernment. What people really mean is don't evaluate me and don't discern between my actions that I'm doing something right or wrong. How do we know Jesus is not referring to evaluation and discernment here in verses 1 and 2? Well, the answer is right here in our passage. Because it's different than what we see in verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 speaks of a very real evaluation. Verse 6 speaks of a very real discernment. In fact, both verses 5 and 6 talk about evaluating and and being discerning. And in fact, verse 6 calls for being discerning. So we can understand that if Jesus was saying, don't evaluate people or don't be discerning in verse 1, that's what he was saying in verse 1, then he would be contradicting himself a few sentences later. And you know what? If we zoom out from our text a little bit and we look at the rest of chapter 7, to just kind of see where this thing sits, we see that Jesus is also saying in verses 15, and, uh, 15 to 20, to beware of false prophets. And to, what? Recognize them by their fruits. It's right here in the same chapter. Evaluation and discernment based on the fruits of others. But something else gives us a clue into the kind of condemnation Jesus is commanding against. You see, when God condemns someone to hell for rejecting him, that's true condemnation. And in that condemnation, there's no forgiveness. We're we're not qualified for that. We're actually commanded to do the opposite. We're commanded to have a heart of forgiveness towards others. Not condemnation. Right here in the same Sermon on the Mount, listen to these words from Jesus. If we just jump back to chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Jesus doesn't tell us that we have permission to judge. Instead, he says, In verse 14, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father or your Father forgive your trespasses. We're called to forgiveness, something that's not included in condemnation. What Jesus says in verses 1 through 2 of chapter 7 falls perfectly in line with what he's been saying, by the way, what he said in chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And then if we rewind just a little bit more, in this same Sermon on the Mount, we go all the way back to the Beatitudes. Remember we looked at those? Uh, I believe that was last year. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So something is consistent in Jesus' teaching here that's all the way across all aspects of the sermon, chapters 5, 6, and 7, regarding the heart of someone who's a true disciple of Jesus Christ. They show mercy. They forgive. They do not condemn others mercilessly. That's not our place. It's not our place. We're we're not qualified to condemn, we're called to mercy and forgiveness. There's, there are two things that Jesus includes in his point here that I believe we can observe. First of all, the reason we're not qualified is because of our sin. Because of our sin. Jesus mentions the, the pronouncement of judgment. He says, with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged. That's verse 2. All right, so the person who judges others in this way invites the judgment of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Jesus isn't talking about believers not being able to serve in 
judicial system of government, by the way. He's not talking about that. He's talking about spiritual judgment. You're not qualified for that kind of judgment. Why? Because of your sin. You're equally guilty. This reminds us of the parable of the wicked servant. We don't have time to walk through that. This morning. Um, But consistently, Jesus has been teaching throughout all of his teachings, not just here in Matthew chapter 7, but in the parable of the wicked servant, he also teaches that our position is rather than being the judge, our position is to extend the same grace that we have received. We're not qualified to be a judge like God because of our sin. We're equally guilty. Second, we're not qualified to judge this way because of our position. Because of our position. Jesus says, with the same measure that you use, it will be measured to you. That's really interesting, uh, referring to this measurement. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, But I believe it refers to the law of God. By the way, the absence of the name of this judge here, it says with the measure you use, it will be measured and you'll be judged. There's no judge that this divine judge isn't named. But we understand that this divine judge is God, the one who judges us. And that's called a divine passive. Um, Most often in Scripture, when that takes place, it refers to God being the judge without God's name being mentioned. You're not qualified to be the ultimate judge of others because you yourself are subject to the only true judge. And that's God. That's God. The person who judges in this way invites the judgment of God. You're you're not in the position to condemn because that position's already taken. You're subject to his divine judgment. Well, is there a way to understand that in more plain language? Let me just say it this way. If you know God's standards well enough to condemn someone else, then you're subject to condemnation when you're guilty of violating those standards. Let me say that again. If you know God's standards well enough to condemn someone else, then you're subject to that same condemnation when you're guilty of violating God's standards. And when are you guilty of violating God's standards? You're already guilty. That means the only way that you could be in the position to pass condemnation on others is to not be guilty of violating God's standards. It's the only way. By the way, in John chapter 8, Uh, There's this amazing scenario when a a mob drags this woman to Jesus. She was caught in adultery. Jewish law called for stoning and Roman law forbade it, so they tried to trap Jesus. Jesus, what, what should we do? So what did he say? Well, he actually sided with Jewish law. He called for stoning. But he qualified it. He said, whoever's without sin, let him cast the first stone. One by one, people walked away. Why? Well, nobody was qualified. Nobody was qualified, but most people missed the point. You see, there really was somebody there who was qualified to stone her. Someone was qualified right there, and it was Jesus. What did Jesus do? He forgave her. He forgave her. True disciples of Jesus understand that they're not qualified to judge by passing condemnation because of their sin, because of their position. That leads us to our our second observation. You're not prepared to judge like God. You're not prepared to judge like God. Look at verse 3. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that's in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? Here Jesus illustrates the point in a way that's almost humorous. Notice the first question. It's a why question. It's a why question. Jesus says, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? It's a a humorous picture because it's an impossible scenario. It's, this is hyperbole at its finest. Of course, there's no way to see a speck in someone's eye if there's a log jammed into your eye. 
Um, we used to have a dog growing up, and he was a hunting dog, big German short hair pointer named Crockett. He was a big male, strong dog. And my dad had stacks of firewood. Oftentimes it was because maybe it was a tree that he cut down. These were not split logs. These were like whole logs. They were just sections of the tree that were cut. And he, he had those in our backyard, and Crockett would run up to the, the log pile, and he would put his mouth on one of these logs and lift it out, and he would run around the yard, and he would chase us, kids, around the yard. And we would see him run around the side of the house, and you couldn't see his head. You could only see his body and a log. And that's exactly what I think of when I read this passage just running blindly with the, just the, it's a log for a head. That's the picture that I get. You know, a log makes you unable to see it all. And Jesus is basically saying, you're blind by your own issues. You're blind by your own issues. Why are you judging someone with something smaller than your own issue? Not only are we not qualified to judge like God, friends, we're not prepared to judge like God. Notice the second question he asks. It's a how question. Jesus asks, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? It's a great question. Is Jesus saying that it's wrong to help your brother? Is he saying that? No, he's not saying that. He's not saying it's wrong to help your brother. Jesus is saying it's not possible to help your brother when you have issues in your life that are not dealt with. Friends, isn't that just like us? Too many Christians become obsessed with making sure everyone else's issues are taken care of while ignoring the issues, the glaring issues in our own lives. Jesus clearly illustrates that our own issues make us unprepared for the task. By the way, if you tried, it, if you tried theoretically, if this were a real scenario and you had a log jammed in your eye and you tried to take a speck out of someone else's eye, you're not going to be able to see and you're going to hurt them. You're going to hurt them. You're going to cause damage to them, probably damage to their eye. But Jesus clearly illustrates our own issues make us unprepared for the task. And this shows us that Jesus was apparently aware of his audience. That people were regularly or habitually doing this, condemning others while ignoring their own sin. Jesus wasn't talking about this issue preventatively. He, was, he, he wasn't talking about this as this could possibly happen. He was talking about this as an interruption to put a stop to the thinking and practice of what was taking place. This leads to our fourth observation. Or, sorry, third observation. I thought we skipped one here. This one's an imperative. You are called to address your own sin. You are called to address your own sin. Look at verse 5. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Jesus' words are very sharp here. We must be careful to understand what he's saying. Notice the word hypocrite. Hypocrite, why does he use that word? Well, he spent so much time describing the worship of hypocrites in chapter 6 through their, their praying, their giving, their fasting. The word hypocrite refers to one who lives by a double standard. That is, there's a different standard um, going on in their real lives than the one that, that they're promoting outwardly to other people. Um, the double standard that Jesus is referring to specifically is the double standard of addressing someone else without addressing your own sin. This is, it's so easy to miss the way Jesus is using the word hypocrite. He's not saying you would be a hypocrite if you do this. He's, he's calling his listeners hypocrites. Why does he do that? Well, because Jesus knows they're guilty of addressing the sins of others without addressing their own sin. Think about that. What would be more, what could be more hypocritical what could be more of a double standard than holding someone else to the standard of God's law while refusing to live according to that standard yourself? 
By the way, in the same chapter, Jesus warns us to look out for false teachers. What do they do? Well, they do many things, but one of those things is to teach people to follow a standard that they're not following. Hypocrites. Hypocrites, what a great word for Mother's Day. Let me ask you a question, moms. Do you hold your children to a standard of strict obedience while refusing to live out that same obedience to God? Do you hold your husband to a standard that's higher than your own? You think, wow, Michael, that's a little heavy-handed for Mother's Day. Yeah, but I don't think it's very far from what Jesus is saying. To be the kind of hypocrite Jesus is addressing is to hold someone else to a standard that you're not seeking after. But notice what Jesus says next. We can miss this one really easy. When we read the sentence in verse 5, take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye, we so often misunderstand the command. Here's what's most misunderstood here in verse 5. We, we think that Jesus is commanding us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. We like that part. We like skipping over the personal surgery part and going straight to seeing how we can, we can clearly you know, see and take action. Here's the problem. Jesus is not commanding us to remove the speck from our brother's eye. He's not doing that here. He does that in other passages. The point of this passage, the command that's in this passage, is to remove the massive timber from your face. Do personal sin surgery. Jesus is not commanding us to take the speck out of our brother's eye, but he he does say we will be able to see clearly so that we can do that. And then 11 chapters from now, in Matthew 18, we'll look at exactly what Jesus describes as the, the right process to address a brother's sin. But this passage isn't about that. This isn't about how to fix other people. It's all about your issues. This is about you. Take out the timber. You're not qualified to judge like God. You're not prepared to judge like God. But you are called to address your own sin. And lastly, you are called to wise discernment. You are called to wise discernment. You are called to wise discernment. Verse 6, do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Really odd expression. It seems really odd to us. Jesus is helping us to distinguish between judgment and discernment. With all of Jesus' teaching in his sermon, everything that we've heard, blessed are the merciful, right? Love your enemies, Forgive others. Don't judge. We could be tempted to think that Jesus is teaching against any kind of negativity at all. As if, as if we're just supposed to look at everyone through rose-colored glasses. And because of our tendency to think that way, Jesus makes a very clear point to tell his audience that not judging does not mean you refrain from assessing. It does not mean you refrain from evaluating. It does not mean you refrain from discernment. By the way, dogs in Jesus' day were far from cuddly. They were awful. They were ragged. They were rough, hated, scavenging animals. Jesus says don't give them what's holy. And he says don't throw pearls before pigs. Pigs were the worst animal in that society. Unclean. What an odd expression. But we've already seen, haven't we, that Jesus uses hyperbole to get across a point? Remember chapter 5, verses 29 to 30, right? You remember that one? If your right eye uh, or your right hand cause you to sin, tear it out or cut it off? That's, that's not literal. If it was literal, then... We should probably all be missing an eye and all be missing our right hand. By the way, what do you get when you have seven 
eyes and seven legs and seven hands. You have seven pirates. I was told that after the last sermon <laughs> this morning. Jesus is not literally saying cut out your eye or cut off your hand. We can remember that Jesus did use extreme language to illustrate a truth. I believe Jesus is doing the same thing here. He comes directly off the heels of talking about timber and a speck, addressing the sin of your brother. And so when Jesus says don't give dogs what's holy and don't throw your pearls before pigs, he's referring to actually having discernment once you get the log off your face. When the log's out of your eye, instead of running around and addressing everyone with your holy wisdom and your pearls of wisdom, be discerning. Don't run after everyone's specs because there will be some who are, who are fools and who are hostile. Have discernment. You know, I get this question all the time, and this relates to this. Um, people from church usually ask me something, and it, the question typically goes like this. I have a coworker or, a, you know, a classmate that does this sin or that sin. Uh, what should I do? What should I do? Uh, my first question is, are they a believer? Uh, most often the answer is no. And when the answer is no, my response is, well, why would you try to clean them up? Their biggest need isn't behavior modification. They need to be made alive because they're spiritually dead and they're enslaved to the flesh. And, you know, I, I believe this is the same kind of scenario illustrated by Jesus' colorful expression when we compare that with what Jesus just said about addressing our own sin first, and then we can be discerning. We must then be discerning about who we go after to remove the specks. Dogs and pigs will turn on you because, why? Well, because they can't eat the pearls. They're not food. In the same way, it would be foolish to try to clean up and modify someone's behavior who has a much deeper need of complete gospel transformation. So don't be the captain of all censorship. Deal with your own sin. When you've done so, you've dealt with your sin, you're commanded to be discerning. You have to make an assessment before offering your wisdom and addressing their issues. By the way, Proverbs mentions this. I love this verse, Proverbs 23, verse 9. It says, Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. What's the takeaway from today? Stop trying to take God's place as the judge. You don't get to condemn people. You don't get to judge people like God because you are held to the same standard of righteousness that everyone else is. When I look at this passage in the simplest language, here's what I see. I must be a person who primarily addresses my own sin. And when my sin is addressed, once it's addressed and dealt with, only then am I able to address the sins of others in love. And yes, helping my brother with his sin is love. It's loving. It's not judging. It's not condemning. And that's why our world does not want to view the word judgment here, don't judge, they don't want to view it as condemnation. They want to view it as evaluating. Don't evaluate me. The Bible says don't evaluate me. And you know what? If, if we believe that, that that's what judging means, evaluation and discernment, then we're never we're never going to be able to share the gospel. Why? Because the gospel involves telling someone that they're wrong and they are headed for eternal punishment. And if our world can get us to stop judging by not saying anything negative and not addressing the real problem, then we can be silenced with the good news. So Jesus doesn't call for us to not evaluate and not be discerning. He calls us not to condemn. That's his job. That's his position. We're not qualified. We're not prepared for it. My response to others 
outside of, of helping my brother forsake his sin and follow Jesus, my response to others is to be consistent with mercy, consistent with forgiveness, consistent with exactly what Jesus has been saying this whole time, to love my enemies and pray for those who persecute me. And when I do address someone else's issues, I must be wise in who I address. Therefore, I'm called to discernment. And friends, that's how you can be genuine. You can leave the judgment to God, you can leave the justice of God in the hands of God, and you must be discerning. Discerning. Let's seek God's help to do that. Lord, would you please help us to live in the way that you have called us to live, which is to not respond out of anger and frustration at people who sin against us or who bother us or do or say evil things against us in our finite and immature minds we immediately want to see those people brought to justice and condemned on the spot and Lord we need to leave that to you Lord, so often we, we immediately run to addressing the issues we see in everyone else's lives while choosing to ignore the sins and the issues in our lives first. Would you help us, Lord, to get our priorities straight? Not just when we come here on Sunday and, and participate in the Lord's Supper and have that evaluation time, but to every day to every day be addressing the sins and the issues that arise in our own lives so that we can be qualified and prepared to love our brothers and sisters in Christ in the way that you've called us to. So Lord, would you do that in us? Would you help us with this? We thank you so much for this church body. We have a great context to live this out. Would you help us do that? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join us in standing as we worship again through song?
as we close. First of all, there's no service tonight because of Mother's Day. So um, if you're able to celebrate a mother in your life, please do so and rejoice with those who rejoice. I want to close our service with the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. He writes, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. You're dismissed.